Hey YouTube preppers, this one's for all you perverts out there that want to stay warm this winter. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. It has been a really warm winter here in New England. We're only halfway through it at this point, but today it's in the middle of January and it's raining. Have the jet stream move to the other side of us and put us on the cold side instead of the hot side, and you know who knows what the rest of the winter is going to be like. But one thing is constant. Even if you've got really warm winters, warmer than they ever have been in recorded history, which they are, it's still uncomfortable in the winter and you want to be able to warm your house even if it is only like in the low 50s you want to be able to warm your house keep yourself comfortable inside the house you want to do that at a minimum of fuel because fuel uh, comes at some kind of an expense whether it's the expenditure of time and effort to get the fuel or the expense of money uh, to you know purchase fuel which itself has to be uh, you know purchased through time and effort for you to earn the money you want to do it at a minimum of expense you want to be able to uh, keep as much of that heat in there and also you want to make sure that you don't asphyxiate yourself in your house from all the carbon dioxide that you are exhaling while you're in the house in the winter when you have your windows closed and that's what this video is going to be all about at our new house we have lots of systems that are working really 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 well at keeping it nice and warm and comfortable inside uh, you know inside the house you know it's just it's t-shirt weather inside the house and we're in a bathing suit and shorts on right now and it's really comfortable inside the house honestly it's not that bad outside either uh, and I want to go through what have we done in our house what have we built into our house because I built this house from scratch from the ground up what have we built into the house that made it so that the house works so well and it does it with so little fuel input we're gonna break this video up into two parts one of them is the heat that's going into the house. Where is that heat coming from? What are those heat sources and how are they getting into the house? That's part one. The second part is we're gonna talk about that thing I mentioned about not asphyxiating yourself. The idea of uh, having your house be warm but not having it so closed up that you, uh, you know, die because you're just exhaling all this carbon dioxide and then you, you know, die in your sleep. So we're gonna talk about it in those uh, two parts because uh, they're both really important. They're both critical. If you wanna stay warm, you need heat going in, but you also need fresh air going in because if you're dead, there's no one there to appreciate the warmth. So let's go into the firewood drying shed right over here. This is the first part of the um, kind of system that I've created is, uh, you know, the, the fuel itself. Uh, this is a firewood shed that I built myself and we're gonna talk about how this uh, shed is uh, constructed. I built a lot of firewood sheds in the, in the past uh, for drying wood and this has a couple of unique uh, functions that honestly I've never, I'm sure other people have done it, but I've never in driving around, uh, you know, here in rural New England, I've never seen anyone build firewood sheds like uh, the ones that I built. Uh, and none of them, uh, as far as I can tell, are anywhere near as effective at drying wood. Before we go in there though, we gotta talk about where the wood comes from initially, and there's a bit of it right here. This is just a pile of fallen logs. Don't worry, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I don't think you need to have that much explanation uh, going into fallen logs. But there are some things uh, you know, related to logs that I think are probably, uh, you know, not things that people are necessarily, uh, necessarily aware of. Uh, this pile of logs right here are logs that were uh, cleared while we were building the house there. Uh, obviously there were tree, well, maybe not obvious. This was a forest. It's just to just be all forest here. And now it's not forest. And when we were clearing out the site, we, uh, you know, generated some, some log piles. Uh, this is uh, probably the biggest one right here. And what I want to talk about, uh, about, uh, you know, firewood is uh, a lot of times people will say, well, this type of wood is good for firewood and this type of wood is not good for firewood. And I want to uh, just sort of address some of that. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not really a tree expert. Uh, I'm big into wild edible plants, but trees are something I, I'm not super great at identifying just from their bark. Uh, but I can tell the difference between some of them, like this one right here, this guy with this little slime mold growing on it right there. You know, I don't, honestly know whether it's safe to touch slime mold. I just touched it anyway. Uh, this is a, uh, a white pine tree or, or a red pine tree. I'm not sure which one of them. Uh, the, the red or white pine trees, let's see if I can find some red around here. These are these gigantic trees right here, these super tall ones. Uh, a lot of people will say white pine. I'm just going to call them white pine. Uh, white pine uh, and red pine are very similar, uh, you know, to look at them. Uh, there's something about like 
I think red pine has uh, clusters of three, le uh, three needles and white pine has clusters of five needles or something like that. You can kind of remember because red has three letters and white has five letters. Don't quote me on that, but uh, you know, from, uh, from a distance to uh, you know, most lay people, they look pretty similar. So a lot of people will say these white pine trees, I'm just gonna call them all white pine trees just for you know, convenience. A lot of people say they make crappy firewood. Uh, and the reason they say that is because uh, pine doesn't carry as much heat as like the hardwoods. Uh, it's not as dense. And the other reason is that it can throw some creosote up into your, your chimney. Uh, both of those things are true, but uh, the fact that white pine doesn't carry as much heat as, you know, a hardwood uh, doesn't make it not a good heat source. It just means it doesn't have as much heat as, uh, you know, something, something else. It's, it's kind of like saying, uh, you know, a 22 is a less effective gun for shooting at someone than like a nine millimeter round, uh, you know, cause a 22 round is smaller. Well, you know, if there, if I'm like a robber and I'm about to like try to like, you know, rob someone's store and they're gonna shoot me with either a nine millimeter handgun or a 22 millimeter handgun, you know, I'm not, honestly not really gonna wanna get shot by either of those. And you know, the same works with cold and different types of firewood. Yes, some types of firewood are less potent than others, but that doesn't mean that the ones that are less potent aren't plenty potent enough. So, you know, if you are thinking about doing, uh, you know, uh, firewood burning, uh, don't worry so much about, you know, what type of wood that you have, because, you know, even stuff that is sort of like old and dry rotted, uh, you know, it is still going to have a fair degree of, of heat left in it. And I burn lots of stuff that's like, you know, really, really dry rotted, kind of, uh, you know, mushy uh, wood. And as long as you, you know, you get it dried out, it's, it's going to be totally fine for you. Uh, you know, where are you going to get your firewood from? Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we've been getting our firewood just from our wood pile uh, that was created while we were, you know, doing this, this clearing up here. Obviously, there are a lot of trees cleared. You know, if that all used to be forests, that's a lot of trees. A number of them are kind of thrown down over on the side over here. They weren't all up in that area. Here are a couple of them that uh, I cut myself. Here's the tops of them. Uh, this one here, you can see it's like kind of like this little stair cut here because we wanted it to fall in that direction. And there, there they all are just sitting down there. We cut this over the summer and I just kind of ran out of time to, to cut and uh, stack it all up. Uh, the tools that I use to cut this stuff up are just a chainsaw. I know a lot of people are a little bit nervous about chainsaws. I'm gonna spin by the, uh, the shed where we keep the chainsaws and we're gonna talk a little bit about those. But I would suggest not being overly concerned about chainsaws. Yes, uh, you can injure yourself with chainsaws. Uh, yes, you can kill yourself with a chainsaw. The same is true with an automobile. Uh, as long as you know what you're doing with it and you take the correct safety precautions, you're gonna be in pretty good shape when it comes to chainsaws. And they're a really, really effective tool. Uh, if you pair them with a, a splitting uh, wedge or, uh, and, uh, or like, like some kind of a, a splitting ax, you can take a forest and you can turn it into really effective heat for your home. Just up over the rise here, you can see the tent with a couple of kayaks on either side. We're gonna pop in there and we're gonna look at the tools that I use to process the firewood. This is just a temporary shed. We're gonna be building something nicer later on. I actually used to use this uh, this tent while I was at my temporary house for covering firewood. Uh, so it's uh, kind of an interesting other use that this thing used to have. But right now it's covering up tools and you know gas cans and garden equipment and sun ovens and all sorts of things. We've got a number of chainsaws here, and I'm noticing at this point that my camera has water on the lens. I'll just uh, clean that up. <laughs> really, I should be using lens cloth for this, but uh, yeah, all I got is a t-shirt right now. Okay, so here we are. We've got a couple chainsaws. These are the two primary ones that I use. This one here is made by Echo, and this is a gas-powered chainsaw. This one over here is made by Digipro. It is a um, lithium-ion battery-powered chainsaw. Uh, they both have their pros and they both have their cons. The lithium ion uh, powered one made by, um, I forget, is the company Greenworks. I think it's Greenworks actually. Yeah, it's called Greenworks, the company that makes this one. Uh, I, I really like this chainsaw. It's really quiet. It, uh, you know, it doesn't make a ton of noise when you're working with it. Uh, you know, I've got solar panels all over the roof of my house, so I can charge this thing up with the solar panels. So, you know, if you know, I can't get to a gas station or gas stations don't have any uh, fuel to sell me. I can still, you know, use my chainsaw. Uh, it is not quite as powerful 
as the gas chainsaws. Uh, you know, I, I will definitely say that. But that said, it's not that much weaker. You know, a lot of people will say that these electric chainsaws are just, you know, they're, they're like feathers as compared to like, the, you know, this is a lightsaber. Uh, you know, it is not that big of a difference. When I, I started off with this electric chainsaw and then I kind of upgraded to this and, you know, I mentioned that, you know, I thought, you know, this is like a feather and this is like a lightsaber. So well, the first time I used this, I was, I was expecting to be kind of like Luke Skywalker, just or Darth Vader, let's call me Darth Vader. Uh, you know, just cutting through things willy-nilly. Um, although that's more of a Kylo Ren kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, and it, it really is not that, you know, uh, even, even the gas powered chainsaws, you know, they can jam up and, you know, yeah, it, it, it's not like having a lightsaber to cut through things. So, you know, they both have their pros, they both have their cons. Uh, this one's a little bit stronger, but you know, you're reliant upon the system more because, uh, you know, you have to get gasoline. Of course, you know, you're reliant on the system with this one too, because you need lithium ion batteries and you know, they're not gonna last forever. But, you know, if you were in a situation where for many months you just couldn't get access to anything, uh, you know, the grid just went down, you know, you're gonna run out of fuel for this a lot sooner than you're gonna run out of fuel for that. Although, I guess I do have an awful lot of gas here. So these are the couple of tools that, uh, that I like to use. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, they're not as terrifying as, uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, talk them up to be. Uh, you know, I understand why they kind of seem sort of fearsome. You, you know, it is sort of like this lightsaber kind of thing. You know, you can tell I'm a Star Wars geek. Um, but, you know, what a, what a chainsaw really is, is it's like the conveyor belt at the grocery store. Uh, you know, you, you put the food on top and it kind of brings it over to the cashier over here. And uh, that, that's really all it is. It's just a conveyor belt for a chain. There's a, a little spinning gear in here. And that when, you, uh, when you're hitting the button to turn the thing on, you're just turning this little gear and the gear, uh, you know, interacts with this chain and it, it pulls the chain around and has it go out to the end and back and forth. Uh, other than that, the only thing that the chainsaw is, uh, really does is it will just, uh, it'll spit some oil out onto your chain to keep it lubricated. Although the, uh, this one at the moment is all clogged up for some reason. It won't, uh, it won't lubricate the chain, so I have to keep dipping the end of the chain into oil whenever I want to use this one, which is why I, you know, pretty much just use this one all the time now. Uh, but, uh, you know, really all it is, like I said, it's just a, it's a conveyor belt for this chain, and the chain just has these little sharp bits, sharp bit here, sharp bit here, here, here. So, you know, as long as you know where the dangerous parts are and you keep yourself clear from them and you understand what can go wrong, like the chain could snap and kind of like spin around. But, uh, you know, if the chain snaps and spin around, uh, spins around, it's likely to stay kind of in a straight line. If I just flip this around, the, you know, th this chain, it, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, it locks itself in a straight line. So, you know, even if the thing breaks, you know, it's not going to like bend into a 90 degree off in some direction somewhere. It's going to kind of fling around like that. And, uh, you know, as long as you keep yourself out of its, you know, path of destruction, even if the thing breaks, you know, you're going to be in pretty good shape. But that said, you should probably wear, you know, safety glasses and, uh, you know, I, I, I wear uh, ear protection when I run the this chainsaw here because it makes so much noise. So you, you really just have to understand what the dangers of them are. And then it's just like an automobile. Automobiles are the most dangerous thing that you or I are likely to interact with all day, but we don't freak out about it. Uh, you know, we just take the precautions that are required. It's kind of like just generally being a prepper. If you're going to be a prepper, you uh, just recognize the dangers that uh, exist and you, uh, you know, make it so that they aren't a problem for you. We don't freak out about it. We don't have nightmares about it. We just, uh, you know, we're just steely eyed, realistic about it and, uh, you know, do what you got to do. Okay, so let's get into this uh, firewood shed. The first thing I want to talk about with the firewood shed, if you build a firewood shed, is it's good to get your firewood up off the ground. Uh, if you just look at the ground here, uh, it's been raining and there's like snow on the ground. Everything's kind of like wet and drippy. And let's just kind of come on over here underneath my structure. And what do things look like over here? Wow, they're really, they're really dry under here. It's like powder. All this stuff under here, it's just, like dry powder under here. Now, if you have your firewood just down on the ground, uh, you're not gonna get that airflow underneath. And airflow is key to drying out your firewood. So what have we got here? We've got a giant drying rack. That's what this whole structure is. I wish I didn't have so much crap in here. Let me come around the other side and I think you can get a better, better sense of it if I can get around this kiddie pool here. Okay, so you can see under here, the entire thing is one giant drying rack. It's a great way of a place to store a bunch of 
other crap. Uh, so the air can really, really get up underneath the firewood pile. It can circulate really well. And uh, you have no trouble drying stuff pretty quickly when it is, uh, you know, in a, in a structure like this. If you build something up off the ground, you always want to make sure that you do this. You want everything to be really well braced because there's a lot of weight up there. And you want to have triangular braces going in different directions to make sure that it's not going to wiggle that way and it's not going to wiggle this way. So we've got lots of bracing in there to make sure that the thing uh, stays up. So let's pop up there and we'll see kind of what we got going up, going on up in here. Honestly, it, under the topic of firewood, the pile of firewood is probably the least interesting of all of it. Uh, but all we can say about the firewood is, you know, in terms of how you're stacking it, if you're going to stack the stuff, it's nice to put these kind of things in there periodically to kind of lock the the firewood pile in place. If you're having uh, you know, round logs in here, having some ones that are cut in half, split like that, is gonna make it a lot easier for it to be stable because it's a lot harder for something that is this shape to roll around than something that is this shape. And also, and I'm gonna see if I can find an example while we're in here, as you're stacking stuff, if you can find things, all right, we got a, got a little bit, of, oh no, here's a great example of it right here. If you got things that have uh, little branches sticking off the side of them, that's a great way of stabilizing your pile too, because things like that aren't gonna roll around. If you've got, uh, you know, things like these, like nubs and anything that'll kind of lock the pile together, these little uh, branches kind of coming off the side of it. So as you're stacking, if you're stacking it with that in mind, you're gonna be able to make a, uh, a much, uh, tighter and safer pile so it's not going to collapse on you. And you can see the mix of wood that I have in here is a mix of, uh, you know, larger pieces and then really, really, uh, you know, grungy small stuff. Uh, these are just, these are just sticks that were in, well, this pile right over here. You know, as I was pulling this thing apart, you can see, you know, there's still some of it in there. There's just a lot of like little sticks and things like that. And a lot of people would just throw that stuff out, but that's wood. You dry that out, that's gonna burn just fine. And I put that right up in the pile too, because you you know, when you're starting a fire, you, you're not gonna just gonna take a take a match to this. You need, you know, smaller things. So why not put the smaller things right in your pile? If you got them there, uh, you know, grab them. And the last thing I wanted to uh, mention, if I can find an example of it in here, there's not a ton of it. Here, here's a piece right up in here, is I mentioned like dry rotted stuff is, you know, it's still fine. Like this thing here. See this stuff? You know, it's all breaking apart like that. Now, is this the, the most potent kind of uh, piece of firewood that I could possibly have? Like, if I was going to go on some kind of a uh, expedition to some remote island and I had to bring all my own fire, uh, my own firewood with me, and I only had an exact amount of space that I could put that firewood into, you know, would I bring pieces like that? No, I would bring, you know, really nice hardwoods that have a lot of energy packed into a small area. But, you know, if, it's, if you're not in that really hypothetical situation where you're going to that island and you only have so much volume and everything, a, a piece of wood like that still has an awful lot of heat in it. You, you, if you think, if you throw that into a fire, like a campfire, just imagine you put that into a campfire, that, that, that duffy kind of piece of decomposing wood, the thing starts burning, and then somebody takes that log out of the fire and, say, and offers to hand it to you. Uh, you know, are you, what is your reaction to that going to be? Are you going to think, oh, well, this, that's just a, a fluffy piece of decomposed wood. There's no heat in that. I can just hold that in my hands. Or are you going to appropriately, appropriately see that it's glowing red and realize that there is an awful lot of heat, uh, you know, being generated by the, uh, you know, combustion of this thing. And if I put this in my hands, I'm going to severely burn my hands. Yes, it has less energy than something like, say, this. Nice hardwood here. I think that might be maple here. I'm not 100% sure. This, I believe, is cherry. I, you know, I honest to God, I can't tell firewoods. But, you know, the hardwoods are going to definitely have more heat in them. But even these kind of decomposed woods, totally, totally fine. So far this winter, I've used maybe a little bit less than a cord of wood. Maybe a half to three quarters of a cord of wood is what we've used so far for this winter. And that is the primary heating source for our entire house. I'm just gonna look down here because these are temporary stairs. We're still working on the stairs. This whole area is gonna have a deck. The, the reason we have two doors here, actually this is something that's pretty uh, important in terms of uh, uh, setting up a woodshed. Um, 
You notice that I was grabbing all the wood from one side and I've just got a small uh, aisle from this side. That's not the way we're going to do it eventually. What we're going to do is have a whole deck here and what we'll do is we'll pile up uh, the firewood so the big hole, the open hole, was on this side. So this summer when I'm uh, grabbing more firewood, I'm going to start piling it on that side and then fill over to this side. And then next year, this is going to be the most dry wood. So we're going to go in from this side and then eat into that side. And then the following summer, we'll fill in this side and we'll enter through that door. And the wood over on that side is going to be the wood that's been drying for two years. So we go through this door one year and then we go through that door the next year and we keep kind of filling them in. Now the stuff that we never get to in the middle is just going to get drier and drier and drier, but I, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. Now at this point, we can't really do that though, because as you can see, we don't have a deck. Um, we can only get into this side, and that's why I left that little aisle so I can get to the other side. But eventually we're going to have a deck that will go all across this whole area here, and we'll be able to go to whichever entrance that we want. And someday, if I can find some used ones, like kicking around at some thrift store, I want to put like a, like a men's room and a women's room <laughs> bathroom signs on there, because doesn't it, it kind of looks like, like a public restroom there. Okay, so let us head inside, and we're going to talk about some of the other heat sources that we have going into this house. Like I mentioned that uh, the wood, the wood, the firewood is our primary heating source, but we do have other heating sources. And one of them is, you can see it right, right here. It's this structure right here. What we got on either side of the house are two greenhouses. There's one on the east, there's one on the west. And uh, you know, this is the western facing greenhouse. And uh, these actually can generate a fair, a fair bit of heat. Uh, the temperature outside today is just about 50 degrees. Uh, I'm going to go into the greenhouse, and honestly, it's probably going to be just about 50 degrees in the greenhouse too, because we have we haven't had sun in two days, so it's just you know we're not getting any of that heat. Although stepping in here, it actually it does feel a little bit warmer. Okay, well, the temperature in here is actually it's a little under 50 degrees, so that suggests to me that it must be even colder than that outside. It's about 45. Just for shits and giggles, let's check out what the temperature is outside. I don't suspect it's gonna be a huge difference. Yeah, we're only, we're only a difference of a couple of degrees. We're just a little over 40 or about six degrees Celsius. So it's not a huge uh, temperature difference today because there's really hardly any sun. There's just some ambient uh, sun filtering through the clouds. Not very much in here, but during the summertime, when this space, uh, you know, uh, you know, does get sun. I actually, let's forget about summertime. Although I'm going to mention summertime just because it's pretty amazing. Uh, the air temperature up here, I've measured it in the summertime with when this vent here was uh, uh, closed up the way that it is now. It was 140 degrees <laughs> up there, and that was actually as high as the thermometer went. So it might have even been hotter than that. 140 degrees up at the peak. Uh, down at the bottom, it was like 90 degrees down here. But summertime temperatures don't really matter in the greenhouse because in the summertime, we just open up that vent and uh, you know, it doesn't get hot in here. When this, pla when this place helps to heat the house, it is in the winter time and it is in the spring and the autumn time. And on a sunny day in here, if it were to be like 40 degrees, 50 degrees outside, we could easily be getting close to 70 degrees in this space here. And how does that really help the house? Well, it helps the house in a couple ways. One, this whole wall here is all touching the inside of the house. So this entire surface, if it is like zero degrees outside, this surface here, it's not zero degrees. So this is a whole surface of our house that's not losing heat out to the outside because it's, uh, you know, it's in the greenhouse and the greenhouse isn't uh, stealing the heat nearly as quickly. When we do have the sun out and it gets warm in here, what we can do is we can open this window here and open this door right here. And this door lets the cool air from the house come out and it floats up as it warms and it goes through this window here. That goes out into the bathroom uh, and you can definitely feel it when you go into the bathroom in the spring and in the, uh, in the autumn. This space here completely works to warm our house for those kind of uh, uh, borderline seasons. The summer, we don't need to heat the house at all. In the autumn, in the spring, we don't have to heat the house with wood because this greenhouse is really doing it for us. So this is another source of heat that we are bringing into the house. So let's go inside and we'll just see how things are working on the inside. 
in here. Now you'll notice that we have a lot of windows here. And one of the first things that people will say when they come and visit our, our house, uh, other than uh, where do you keep your dead bodies, is they'll see these windows and they will think, well, you know, you guys must not have to heat your house at all because you got all these windows that are uh, you know, just allowing all this sunlight in. And to some degree that's true, but when you buy windows that are made with a low E um, coating on them, which uh, makes it so that they kind of prevent heat from radiating through them. They do that to make it so heat doesn't radiate out of your house, but it also makes it so heat doesn't radiate into your house from the sun. So you kind of, you lose energy and you, you save energy with them. So we don't actually get a lot of heat coming into these windows. Through the greenhouse, it's a different story. Uh, the windows up there are, uh, are not covered in that low E glazing. So these do allow that kind of thermal energy through. But the windows in here, they are, uh, are not allowing a lot of heat through. One thing that I'm sure you can notice right off is that uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot more warmth and humidity in here. You can see right on the lens of the camera, we've got this kind of like uh, misty kind of feeling here. That's not the way it looks to the human eye. Uh, but you know, if you, ever, if you wear prescription glasses or something, you go from a cold place into a warm place, you get that kind of fogging up. And we're seeing that because it's really comfortable in here. And it's not actually very humid. Uh, we, we measure the humidity in here and we're like uh, about 55% humidity in here. So it's just because the, the camera's lens got kind of cool outside that we're, we're uh, um, kind of condensing up. So here is the main heating source of our house. And we did, we did run a fire today, you know, mostly just to make it a little bit more comfortable. And we also use it for like cooking and things. Um, and this is what generates the heat for our entire, our entire living space in here, this tiny little uh, uh, wood stove. This is a, um, an Encore stove made by Vermont Castings. I really like the Vermont Casting stoves. Uh, one of the things I love about them is, oh, actually, you'll see the condensation disappear on the camera because we're getting uh, close to the wood stove. It'll just uh, evaporate it right off the lens uh, in a matter of seconds, I would think. Uh, one of the things I like about them is they've got this, uh, this cook surface on the top that you can use to uh, you know, cook breakfast. We're always putting uh, you know, tea kettles on there or cooking soup or doing toast or any number of other things uh, on the wood stove. They are really, really uh, useful devices, not just for warming the space, but also for you know, warming, up, uh, warming up your food. You can also see above it, and this is it's connected to the wood stove, so I'm gonna mention it. It's not directly connected to heating the house, although it does heat the house, is this device right here, which I am really in love with. It has pros and it has cons. I'm gonna talk about them both in the, uh, this video right here. This is made by Cylinder Stove. Uh, they're in Chester, Utah. Their phone number is 800-586-3829. They put it right on the plate right there. Um, if you have a wood stove, and you can get one of these things, I would so highly recommend it. It's a wonderful device. It's an oven that just uh, fits right over the top of your, uh, uh, your chimney pipe. Uh, this is a six inch chimney pipe coming out of here and it has a couple of oven racks. Uh, there's one uh, right there that's not in right now because I put something large in there. There's another one. These are actually not the ones that came with it. I did not like the ones that came with it. They, they just came like with like a, a muffin tray and a, um, uh, some kind of like other other baking tray uh, that was kind of deep. Uh, I, I I didn't much care for it. Uh, you know, if only just for the fact that they were covered in like nonstick uh, coatings and stuff. I I got rid of those right away. But I replaced them with these uh, stainless steel uh, racks, which actually don't completely fit. I have to modify them a little bit. Still, you can see it's a little uh, crooked in there. That's the only way that it actually stays up. But the racks aside, it's a wonderful wonderful device. And if I leave it open. I just leave it open a little bit. When the wood stove's operating, uh, it, it's helping to heat the house. It's like leaving an oven open because that's exactly what it is. You don't even need the word like. It is leaving an oven open to heat your house. And it works really, really well. The one thing you have to uh, do periodically on the back side here, there's a little uh, crank. And you run, the, you run this crank to kind of clear out any creosote that forms up in, your chi uh, you know, in the chimney area right around it. But uh, I think it's a really, really great device. And the one downside of it is it does impede, to some degree, the, uh, the flow of gases up your, uh, up your chimney pipe. Uh, without that in there, we have uh, exceptional draft uh, coming off of this uh, wood stove. It's uh, a straight shot from there 
right up all the way to where it uh, exits the house right up there. And uh, we had exceptional, exceptional draft. Once I added that oven in there, it, you know, the draft wasn't quite as good. But uh, I think it's certainly worth it. <laughs> I think it's absolutely worth it because uh, it's just so great that you can you know, do baking uh, uh, in addition to uh, doing all the other things on the, on the cook stove. You can do baking and uh, you, know, you don't need electricity, you don't need anything, you just need some firewood and some sticks from outside and you can, uh, you can cook all your meals. And at the same time, you're heating your house. So there's a couple extra things that I want to uh, look at related to uh, this wood stove. And they, they actually sort of start tying into the air quality in here. And those things are gonna be upstairs. So let's head upstairs. This house is kind of three stories. Uh, we've got our, our downstairs, which is sort of like a walkout basement. If we can look at it from this perspective here, you see the uh, floor there, it's all concrete. So this is sort of like a, a basement, but with uh, a, a nice colored concrete floor uh, and windows all on one side. So we've got that. And now we're going up to the top level here. Okay. So here we are up on the third floor and this is where all the heat rises. You've always heard that heat rises and it's true. And these vents that you see right here are on the third floor at the peak of the roof. You can see the room we're in. This is uh, River's bedroom. We've got a peak. That's where all the heat uh, rises to. There's a little hole through there. You can see there's a, a doorway and then a hole over here. So the, the heat from the wood stove comes through there, through this area. And we've got these two vents up here. And what these vents do is they grab the, the warmest air and they draw it down into this little box. It's a very messy closet. River's using it as his toy storage closet at the moment. But in the back corner here, there's a box. And in there, there is a dehumidifier and a pipe that goes down all the way to the, uh, to the first floor. And we're gonna head down there right now. And I'm going to show you what that does, because that that is really the key to this entire system. If uh, if you only get one thing out of this entire video, this is probably the most important thing that we do for keeping our house uh, warm and comfortable. Yes, the wood stove that you see right in front of you is very important. That is our original source of heat, but. If you have a wood stove in your house, it can tend to make it very warm and cozy right around the wood stove and other areas of the house can tend to get kind of cool. I've lived in a house with a wood stove before. I've experienced that. And because of those experiences, I wanted to do it differently this time. And what we wanted to do is get the heat stored somewhere. And where we've decided to store it is down inside the floor itself. Now I mentioned that this is just a kind of a basement concrete floor. There are so, there's something like uh, six inches of concrete underneath, uh, the, well this floor is made up out of six inches of concrete and under that uh, are, is a bunch of packed gravel and a series of tunnels and the tunnels all lead to here. Remember those uh, couple of grates that we saw all the way up to the third floor? They lead through some metal conduit and the metal conduit uh, uh, goes to a fan and the fan blows all that air through a series of tunnels that start all the way back over in that corner of the house. It's back like in a kind of a closet area. It blows it down into the floor and then there is a matrix of tunnels under here and they all eventually lead to right here. And I'll just lift this thing up and this is where all the air blows from. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see anything if I lower the camera down. I'm just gonna lower the camera down you can see, we've just got a series of cinder block tunnels under here. And the purpose of this is that it allows us to take all that very humid air that is going upstairs, that warm, humid air. We get to dehumidify it with that dehumidifier that I mentioned, pump it down under the floor, and all that excess heat you know, when you're running the wood stove, it's creating an awful lot of heat and you're getting all that heat all at once. 
Uh, if you don't want to be running a wood stove all the time, you want to be able to store that heat and then kind of slow release it. And that is exactly what this floor does, is that we pump the heat under it when we uh, create a bunch of the heat. The floor stores it and then slowly trickles that heat out over a series of, you know, hours, days, you know, even weeks, uh, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. And it totally um, smooths out the performance of having a wood stove. So instead of whenever we heat this up, the house cooks, and then whenever this thing is turned off, the house gets really cold, we got this floor, and the floor is just, uh, it's somewhere around 40 tons worth of rock and concrete that stores that heat and then slowly releases it. So that is how we get the heat into the house. The next part of the story is how do we uh, run this house in a way where we are not, uh, where we're not uh, suffocating ourselves? Because uh, one of the great ways of keeping the heat in the house is having lots of insulation, and we do have lots of insulation. We have four inches of urethane foam insulation on the, on the walls, and we have six inches of urethane foam insulation on the roof, and that does do a good job of uh, keeping the heat in, uh, but you, know, you also want to uh, you know, make it so leaks aren't leaking the air out of your house. You know, you've put a lot of effort into you know, heating up this air, so you want to uh, try to reduce as much of that uh, as you can, but at the same time you need fresh air. If you're going to have humans in there, you need to have fresh air, and that is the second part of this video, and that whole story starts right here with this thing that apparently a bear mistook for a beehive a while ago. It got attacked by a bear in this corner. Uh, it had the whole corner torn out of the thing. It's not a beehive. It is an air intake vent. Uh, what we've got is a couple of slots under here. I'm gonna see if I can get a, a shot here. This is uh, some, let's see if I can do it so you're not getting blinded by the glare. This black stuff here is uh, a ridge vent ins insulation. So air can get in through there. And up inside of this box, we have a bunch of HEPA filters. Uh, it's pretty much lined with HEPA filters on both sides. So it's bringing uh, a, lot of, a lot of air in, into that box. And then we've got a couple of these black tubes. Now, one of these black tubes goes into the root cellar uh, or our fallout shelter. And that one's closed off on the inside of the fallout shelter. Uh, you know, it, it, that's just there if we ever need to use it. And the other one, I believe it's this one here on the left, that one goes into the house. So, this is where all of our air originates, is here in the back of the house. If you ever visit our house and you want to like, I don't know, like say, kill us in the middle of the night, if you set up some kind of like a poisonous gas, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, experiment here, uh, this is where it would be brought into the house. Uh, to kill all of us. I know, it's, given that this is a prepping channel, a lot of people are going to say, you know, if you wanted to do this properly, you'd you'd hide that, you'd disguise it in some way. Um, yeah, sure. I, 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 I guess you, ideally, yes, you would do that. It, it hasn't yet been a problem that, you know, nobody's come here and tried to gas us out of our house with, like, nerve gas or anything like that. I'm not saying it can't happen. It just, it hasn't happened yet. So that is the beginning of... Uh, of uh, where the air begins its journey. And these chickens are where the air ends its journey. And we're gonna get there in a little bit, but these, <laughs> these chickens are definitely part of our whole air cycle. They were considered, and, uh, and they're an important part of our family. So they are definitely part of the equation here. So we're gonna go in through the east greenhouse here. And I wanna show you a very important part of what makes this whole, uh, quality of air uh, situation work here in the house, and it is in our pantry. So we're going to go back into the pantry here. The air temperature inside the house right now is it's like 72 degrees, and we're going to go into the pantry, which has insulation on the walls and an air conditioner running, and the temperature in the pantry, it's a little hard to read that, it says 52. It's 52 degrees in the pantry, and this thermometer reiterates that kind of 52 degrees. Um, so, you know, that, that, that part is definitely working. We've thermally isolated uh, this from the rest of the house. We're able to keep this nice and cool. We've got a second, uh, 
a second thermometer back here for just confirming what the temperatures are. And there's a couple different ways we keep this cool. I don't want to linger too much on how we keep it cool. Uh, but one of them is just the fact that it's buried into the earth. Uh, whenever you're buried into the earth, uh, you know, here at this latitude anyway, uh, you get down below the ground. It's, it's the, the earth temperature, you know, gets down to about 50 degrees. So the fact that we're just underground pushes that kind of 50 degrees kind of temperature. Uh, we've got the air conditioner going, like I said, which is set to bring us down to 50 degrees. So that, that's going as well. And in the winter time, we've got this window right here. Now I don't have this window cracked open today just because it is kind of on the warm side and humid outside. I know we already looked at the temperature and it was like 40 something degrees, but it was very, very humid out there. It's kind of rainy and we can get dripping happening on this window. But when it's cool and dry outside, I crack that window open. And even if it is like zero degrees outside, uh, I leave it open and it's not enough to like freeze the water pipes or anything like that in here. It just ca provides us with kind of a static uh, additional kind of uh, source of, of cool coming in here. Anyway, that's another uh, aspect to the uh, thermal considerations of the house is you want some areas warm and comfortable to live in and the other ones, other areas to be cool because this place is kind of like a gigantic refrigerator. Look at that just big silver rectangle right there. This is the air exchanger for our house. The last homestead that I built did not have one of these and you could definitely feel the difference. In the, in the winter time the air inside just felt stale. It didn't feel like you, you were really getting uh, you know a quality breath when you were uh, breathing. Sometimes you'd open a window in order to just get some fresh air. Uh, when you open a window to get fresh air into your house you know you're dumping a lot of that nice warm air out. You're also getting oxygen in so it's it's a, a trade-off that you're willing to accept. But this thing makes it so that you can have your cake and you can eat it too. What this thing does is it takes in fresh air from the outside and it expels stale air from the inside and what it does is uh, through a series of kind of uh, little manifolds and things on the inside it tries to extract as much of the warmth from the air uh, as it can before it blows the stale air outside or conversely in the summertime it'll try to extract as much of the cool from the air as it can before it blows your you know otherwise nice cool indoor air outside I absolutely love this device. It's made by Panasonic. I'm going to read the uh, serial number. It's the, the model number FV-10VE1. I really, really like this. Um, Panasonic is a company. Uh, they, they make cameras. Uh, they make lots of different uh, uh, consumer electronics. I really love Panasonic's products. But if you get one and you ever need tech support, God help you because they just do not, they do not support their products in terms of tech support. But their stuff almost always never breaks. Uh, you know, it, the stuff that they make seems to be really well made, and maybe, maybe that's why they don't invest in their tech support department, because they figure, well, it's such a small fraction of the, the people are ever gonna have a problem with our product, why even, you know, hire anyone to help these poor souls. But um, I really, really love this particular unit. It does a great job. Uh, this pipe here, uh, with this white insulation around it, this goes directly out to that outdoor vent that we saw out there. Air comes in here, it enters the unit, it does kind of a crisscross up to this side here, and it goes out this pipe here, and it blows out that way into the kitchen. And it blows out conveniently right over all of the drying dishes. Whenever I uh, have dishes out to dry, they dry a lot faster uh, with this thing going there because, you know, we have nice uh, dry air coming from the outside to dry them. So that is the air coming in. Now you can't just keep pumping fresh air in, you also have to expel the, the stale air. And you, you always have to keep a balance uh, between the two. In terms of the balance, you want, to be, um, you want to be pumping the air in at a little higher pressure than you pull the air out. Um, and there, there's a couple reasons for that. One, if you have radon in your house, you don't want to be pumping air out faster than it's coming in because then you're creating a bit of a vacuum and you're going to be sucking radon up from the ground. We do have radon here and that would definitely be a concern for us. So we always make sure that we're pumping the air in at slightly higher uh, pressure than we are having the air go out. And you, on this unit, you uh, work that with this uh, little adjustment knob where you have supply air and exhaust air, and you can have those uh, fans running at slightly different pressures. The other reason you don't want to do that, and this is related to us heating the house, is we have a wood stove. Again, if you create kind of a vacuum in your house and you have a wood stove, uh, 
you're gonna have a tendency of sucking some of that smoke out of the chimney pipe and you definitely don't want to be doing that so whenever you're bringing air into your house bring it in at a slightly higher pressure than you are exhausting out to just try to make sure that all your air is coming from your supply source and it's not getting sucked out of your chimney it's not getting sucked up out of you know is radon out of your ground just a food for thought there okay so let's talk about the exhaust side now one uh, exhaust line well actually there's only one exhaust line it starts all the way upstairs. Remember how we had those vents that were upstairs that go underneath the floor? On the other side of the house, uh, we have, uh, actually, I'm, I'm gonna explain that a little bit uh, better so I'm, I don't confuse anyone. Remember when we were up, uh, upstairs, uh, it was in my boy's bedroom and there were those two vents right at the apex of the roof. And I said that those draw air down and blow it into the floor and then it comes up inside the house right in that grate. That is a separate system from this. That does not interact with this system, but it's similar to this uh, system in that this line right here also gets its air from all the way up on the third floor. Uh, the reason that I chose to get the air, this is the stale air that we're removing from the house. The reason that I chose to get the stale air that we wanted to remove from the house from the third floor is because we have a wood stove. Sometimes when you're using the wood stove, in fact, oftentimes, because I'm, I can be pretty cavalier about it, uh, you'll open up the wood stove to put some fuel in and some smoke will come out. That's just kind of a normal thing. You open up the top, you know, uh, and you know, a puff of smoke or, or some little sparks come up out of the wood stove. Um, nothing to worry about, but you're releasing smoke into the house. Where does that smoke go? It's warm air, it goes up. That is why I put the, uh, the collection point for the stale air for the whole house up on the third floor because all that smoke, I thought that was really important. I wanted to get that out of the house. If we did not have that wood stove, I would have put the collection point for stale air on the lowest part of the house. The reason I would have done that is things like radon, they're heavier, they, they would tend to stay low. Things like CO2, carbon dioxide that we exhale, it's heavier than the rest of the air, it tends to stay low. Uh, humidity, that's, you know, humid air is heavier than uh, drier air, so that tends to stay low. So all of those things uh, would suggest you'd want to have your stale air collection point be as low as possible, somewhere down on like your first floor, you know, potentially like right down next to the ground somewhere. But because I really wanted to make sure that I was collecting all that smoke that might come up out of the uh, chimney, I ended up putting up on the third floor. If you set up a system like this, you should make that same kind of balance yourself. If you don't have a wood stove, I would highly suggest you grab your stale air from the lowest part of the house, not the way that I did it here. So anyway, the way I did do it here is that up on the other side of the house, we were on the west side of the house for the air that was being grabbed to blow under our floor. On the east side of the house, we have another uh, pipe in it pipes the air down to here. It kind of goes back behind that pipe into the unit here. It does the crisscross up here. And this is the warm air coming back because this is our warm stale air. It kind of crisscrosses and intermingles, uh, not physically intermingles, but like uh, intermingles in, through a manifold with the clean air coming in, gives its heat to the clean air, which goes out that way. And then the stale uh, air, which has been cooled down a little bit, goes through here and goes through that wall. Where does that wall go? Now, if you watch my homesteading uh, building series, you remember that I, I, this hole and this hole, I actually cut through the wall later on with a giant uh, drilling bit that I ended up buying. It was like 350 bucks for the tool, but it was a heck of a lot cheaper than uh, hiring someone to do the job. And I think I, it was actually a lot easier too. And I think I probably did a better job. Where does this, oh, we get to see, oh, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but look at this. That is where we put the Roomba. Isn't that kind of clever? Right under the refrigerator. I built this little home for it right there. It raises the refrigerator by just a few inches. I think it's like five and three quarters inches higher, uh, but it, it's a great place for the Roomba to hang out. It gives better air circulation under the fridge. It makes it so under the fridge doesn't get all dusty. It gets the Roomba out of our, our way because you know, otherwise, you know, where are you gonna put the Roomba? People are we're tripping on it and things like that. Uh, and also, uh, for someone like me, I'm not particularly tall, but um, I guess I'm taller than some people. I always hated like having to like crouch all the way down to the ground to access the vegetable drawers at the bottom. Now with the whole thing up six inches or so, it's a lot easier for me to get things out of the vegetable drawer. So if you've got a Roomba under the refrigerator, it's a pretty cool place to put it. Okay, back to topic. We're going back out to the Eastern Greenhouse where the chickens reside temporarily. And we're gonna see where the air comes out. This is where the air comes out. Through this vent. 
right here. Now, uh, the, uh, the thing's not running right now. This, this flap pops up. The thing only runs, I think, 40 minutes out of the hour. But that's where the air comes out. So we, we are taking the warm air that was left over from the house and we try to cool it down as best we could to try to uh, you know, keep that heat in the house. But what warmth is left in it doesn't go to waste. It goes to keep our, our chickens more comfortable. Uh, it also makes it so that there is a constant supply of air moving into this, uh, this space. And that is going to make it so that we have, uh, you know, just uh, uh, higher quality air for the chickens because, you know, they poop. And uh, right now, I think their, their coop could probably, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I think their coop could probably use a cleaning. So, uh, you know, I, I can smell a little bit of ammonia in the air right now. So uh, having that constant supply of air coming from the house helps to kind of push some of this ammonia air out of here. And also, and this is kind of interesting, the wood stove. If you're gonna set up a wood stove, a great way of setting up a wood stove so you don't create that negative um, pressure environment where you're creating a suction in your house is to use an outdoor air adapter for your wood stove. And the outdoor air adapter for our wood stove comes right up here. There's a little lid on there. That's a pipe and this, all the air that goes into our, uh, our fireplace starts right here. It's actually looking pretty dusty. I should clean that thing off for sure. But this is where all the air starts for our, our fireplace. So instead of it drawing air from inside of our house, it's drawing the air from this environment. And that is, again, uh, just uh, kind of promoting fresh air coming into this space because we're creating a bit of a suction in here. So we're recycling some of the already warmed air that uh, you know was warmed up inside of our house. Our exhaust air is going through. I guess we're pumping some ammonia uh, laden air into the wood stove. I'm not sure if ammonia is uh, good for combustion or bad for combustion. I haven't noticed any deleterious effects of it. But that is the complete system. That is beginning to end. How we uh, manage the heat in our house, how we create the heat, how we keep the heat, and how we make it so that the air quality in our house is as um, as high quality as it possibly can be. One of the big issues, I think, uh, you know, if you are new to uh, doing things like combustion and wood stoves and all that type of thing, is to forget about the, uh, you know, the ideas about, you know, making sure you have, um, you know, you don't have uh, gases that are, are problematic uh, leaking into your house, or you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, carbon dioxide accumulating because you're not having enough ventilation. All of these things are really, really important. And once you can get them all balanced, you can take a situation that for many people in the world is really difficult right now. People are having a lot of trouble when the grid goes down in some area and their house is addicted. I think that's an appropriate way to, uh, to, to speak about it. Their house is addicted to you know, energy off the grid. It, uh, well, it's, it's like an addict coming off of something that they don't have access to anymore. It can be really painful and um, you know, dangerous in a lot of situations. But if you can create something that isn't addicted to that system and you can just go around and you can pick random, you know, just junk up off the ground and use this, you know, we dry it first, but use that to heat your house. You use a piece of, uh, you know, a piece of rotted log or something like that that you dry out to heat your house. If you can get yourself off of that system, uh, you can take situations that are really, really uncomfortable, dangerous, deadly for a lot of people, and you can make them, oh God, really, really comfortable. That's the greatest thing about this construction that we've created. You know, yeah, you can look at it as though it's like, oh, you know, crazy praxis, he built this house because he's afraid that like the grid's gonna go down. Or crazy praxis, he built this, this house because you know, he's, he's worried that he's you know, not gonna have access to you know, propane or this, that, or the other thing. You can look at like, what preppers do through the, the lens of fear, and a lot of people who come to prepping channels do that. But there's a flip side to it, and this is where myself certainly and many other preppers, uh, you know, reside. Is just, just, it's so relaxing. It's so wonderful knowing that you know you're just fine. It's like, it's taking something that is potentially on your plate and just, you're just removing it from your, uh, you know, your realm of concerns. Uh, it, it's just getting rid of things that other people have to at least kind of keep in the back of their minds. I know a lot of people like, you know, normal people that just, you know, live on the grid and they're addicted to the grid and everything like that. They, don't, they oftentimes don't claim to think about things like this, but I think it's got to be kind of there in the back of their heads. I know I'll have debates with people, uh, you know, here uh, on YouTube in the comment sections where people say it's like, you know, you preppers, you keep saying, uh, you know, all these things are going to happen. And like, I've never seen any of it happen. 
which I think is really difficult because, I mean, like, presently, the, the things that we talk about are, are happening all over the world. So I, I think it's getting increasingly more difficult for people to kind of have that sense of things. You know, yeah, sure, 20 years ago, a lot of the things that preppers talk about were kind of like hypothetical. It's like you could see that, you know, power outages happened in other places in the world, but it was sort of hypothetical that we'd have a big problem with it here in the United States. It was kind of thing where it's like, you know, we sort of we saw where things were going and we kind of could project forward. It's like, well, you know, if everything people are saying about energy supplies is true, then eventually there are going to be like you know problems with that kind of thing. So you know maybe I should solve this. But it was still it was hypothetical you know a couple decades ago. Today it's it's not even hypothetical. It's happening constantly all around. So it's it's kind of difficult I think for people to keep themselves in that headspace. A lot of people really strive to try to you know continue living there, but um, uh, you know that's got to take a toll. And it, to live your life in a way where you have to have blinders on to so many things. You know, again, back 20 years ago, you, your blinders could kind of be out here. It's like there were things happening in that part of the world and that part of the world. You can kind of keep your blinders on. You can pretty, you, know, you can enjoy most everything. But at this point, you know, there's stuff happening so frequently all over the place that, I mean, people's blinders are practically like glacier glasses at this point. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see the glacier here. I, I mean, I, I can see a little bit of snow here and there, but I, I don't know what this glacier is that you guys are talking about. Because people got these slits. It's like down to slits at this point. You create something like this for yourself and you don't have to live your life with the slits. You can, you can be aware of everything that around you, that, is going on around you. You don't have to like it, but you can accept that that is the way things are, but you don't have to live in existential fear of it. And that is what prepping is all about. Prepping is about getting past ever really having to worry about like, can I cook my meals for my family? Of course I can, I've got wood all over the place. Can I heat my house for my family? Of course I can, I've got wood all over the place. You know, can I keep my air exchanger running so I can have fresh air? Of course I can, I've got solar panels all over the roof. You take all of these things that, other people either have to just worry about or ignore, and you turn them into not a problem at all, and a le legitimately not a problem at all. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found it useful. If you ever want to do something like this for yourself, you can always hit me up, emails at praxisprepper at gmail.com. I'm always really happy to talk about things that I've done and you know, bounce ideas off me. I've done this a lot, and I'm always happy to you know, comment on my thoughts on what other people might be planning. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey, YouTube preppers. If you enjoyed this video, then you're going to love this video where I talk about how to stay warm all winter long using only bathing suits and summer clothes.